Rich, uh, Board of Finance, Board of Selectmen joint meeting for the purposes of reviewing the various capital budgets of the departments. And tonight is, uh, it says Thursday on here, but it's obviously Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Um, Harvard. Karen around or she got, I got a Karen. Okay. So um, as I explained, if those of you didn't hear me, the agenda that was uh, sent to the town's clerk's town clerk's office was missing a department, uh, number four, which is the fire department. So just to make everything perfectly legal, we're gonna I'm gonna take a motion on the board of finance and then Beth's gonna take a motion on the board of selectmen to approve this agenda. So I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, capital budget agenda as we receive today. Second. Okay. All those in favor on the board of finance could just give out a yes. 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 Okay, that's good. Okay, Beth. Thank you. Um, I'll make a motion that we and uh, have the fire department to item four on the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Um, all in favor, shout them out and raise your hand, please. Aye. Aye. Looks unanimous. Okay. Thank Very you, Matt. Good. Okay. Next. Uh, our first is the uh, first item on our agenda is building maintenance, which is Brad Parsons. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, for those that you don't know me, uh, my name is Brad Parsons. I am responsible to write the building maintenance and pool and gym capital and operating budget. And tonight I'd like to start off on the first page. Hopefully everybody can follow along and we're all together. Uh, the FY23, which talks about air conditioning installation and architectural engineering review. And hopefully Tony's here and I'm here. Yeah, I can speak a little bit about this better on that. So uh, as part of the uh, review of the American Rescue Plan Act, the town has identified a possible project, which would be the uh, improvement of the uh, air conditioning and ventilation at the center building. So as part of that review, uh, we've, at least the information we have so far is that the design and engineering for the project is not covered by the act, but the construction is. So, um, and as we look to get more information on that, uh, this budget would cover an S, this is an estimate of what we think the engineering would be to uh, complete a, a design for the improvement of the uh, air conditioning and ventilation for the building, possibly the heat, uh, depending on the uh, results of the uh, study. And uh, this would include both the senior center section, the gym, and then the main building. Those are the three areas that would be part of this project. Okay, so while this says 75,000 from the general fund, this is gonna come out of that money we got? No, this is, see the, the money does not pay for engineering. Oh, oh this is just engineering. Right. Okay. okay. We're, sure we're looking to get more information on this because it's all yeah. sort of moving quickly. That makes, that but, makes a lot of sense. Right? It makes a lot of right. sense. Right. So this is to leverage basically the um, the money that it would cost to do that construction. Okay. Well, it's possible they might clarify that and we will be right. able to use this. Correct. We're hoping to, you know, the information is. That's a lot of money. Why not let us use that? So, okay. So we'll get more information and present it as we move forward in the process. Okay. Okay, okay all set. The second item on my list is uh, new paint and carpeting, new doors and hardware in the center building. Uh, one of the rooms behind the center gymnasium that was utilized by the Boy Scouts for many, 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 many years, hmm. uh, for as long as I've been here. Uh, they vacated that room. Uh, Chief Capiello requested that he uh, be able to take over that room for desperately needed storage. He was given that room. Uh, I cleaned the room out, all the remaining articles in that room. Uh, it definitely needs new doors. They're going to be putting file cabinets in there with secure information. It needs new doors, hardware. Uh, it probably hasn't been painted in over 30 years. Uh, it has the original carpet in there that's just Rated 30 years. Uh, it should be shampooed. Uh, the lighting fixtures, the light bulbs are fine, but the, I should say, the lenses on the fixtures are yellow. People have been smoking in there for 30 years. Uh, it 
definitely needs a little bit of an overhaul before he decides to move in. Uh, I cannot rip the carpet up. I have to leave the carpet in place for the time being and at least get it shampooed. There are two entry points, one from the PD side, you can come into that room, and one from the center building side, just past the gymnasium up the hallway. Uh, the doors that are currently there are split right down from top hinge to bottom hinge. He's requesting that I uh, put this in my budget so we could spruce up that room. If I remember correctly from my son's very short-lived Boy Scout career, uh, that's a pretty good-sized room, right? It is. Yeah. Very good size room. Good heat. Uh, Frank's looking forward to ut uh, utilizing it. Uh, he's got some cram spaces with some file cabinets and some rooms where you could barely move. <clears throat> and apparently, that's what he's going to use it for. Okay. Any questions? Next item. On, any it, questions on this? Eleven thousand. Any questions? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question. Do you know what's underneath that carpet? I do. What is it? Share it with us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> something that isn't very good. Okay. Uh, uh, there are some tiles underneath the carpet that may be uh, suspect, I should say. Uh, it may and, be asbestos vinyl or something like that. Yeah, it is a good possibility. And as long as I leave it intact, I can keep the carpet clean for many years. Right. Consider it's a storage room. I, I see no reason to get into that. Okay. Good. okay, next, 150 chairs. Yes, these uh, 156 chairs, as you well know, we use folding chairs for all our meetings. I guess it's one of the biggest last meetings we have was in the uh, new firehouse where we trucked over over 300 chairs. We currently have 340 chairs in stock underneath the stage in the center building. Uh, I'd say out of 340 chairs, 40 to 50 chairs, are in fair shape the, the remaining chairs some have pads on them that are shredded and torn some just have a wooden pad they're splintered uh really cracked up the feet are completely either rubbed off raw or rusted off uh, we're in desperately need of getting some new chairs i understand uh, after talking to betsy agler that the rotary club is interested in donating some chairs also uh, nowhere near as many as this, but a few, so we can cycle out some of these chairs. Uh, they're better than 30 years old. Easily, we got them from Beecher Road School. They threw them out, so we took those chairs for here. So it's approximately $32 a chair, and 5000 I can get 156 chairs. Any questions? I think... The next item is sand and refinish the gymnasium and town hall hardwood floors. And I, I must say that the, the chairs are not helping those floors, especially in the center gym. Uh, that's down to pretty much bare wood, but that's in fiscal year 24. Yeah. Uh, 25 is the new uh, vehicle for building maintenance. The, uh, the van overall is in good shape. Uh, Engine wise and transmission wise, what's hurting the van mainly is it's rusting out. The rust is going to eventually get the van. That's the problem with the van. And in 27 is the elevator modernization upgrade uh, requested by uh, Eric Worthman, the library director. And 27. I also have another fifty thousand dollars from Eric to wallpaper and repaint the interior of the library, and that will handle building maintenance. Any questions at all? I had a quick question about the elevator. Is that because that's a sizable expenditure? Is is that the useful life of the elevator, or we're anticipating that will be the useful life? Oh, I have a, a different, you know, take on the elevator. I don't. Believe there's anything wrong with the elevator a few years ago i just made some significant upgrades to the elevator all the mm -hmm. button controls are brand new the, the software is new it's very rare you find a an elevator structurally or major problem with the elevator piston go bad it's rare 
but Eric wanted it in there at the time. I don't think it's absolutely necessary. I will adjust it every well, I year we'll, as we'll I see, see fit. Yeah, we'll see as we get closer to yeah, fiscal that's year. That's right. It'll, it'll be definitely Sorry. adjusted. <laughs> All right. Thank you. It works great. And when the time comes, Tony, I know you're there somewhere. Couldn't we use maybe some of the library fund money for that? We certainly could. Okay. Uh, the only restriction on the library fund money is that we do not go uh, below the original principal. Gotcha. Okay. Right. Well, this is this is so this would qualify. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, any other questions for Brad on building maintenance? <clears throat> okay. Then we can move on to his other responsibility, which is the pool pool and gym expense. All set. Yes, sir. Pool and gym. The first item in FY twenty three is I'm requesting funds to change. Well, let me start off by saying to filter the pool water, we have two high rate sand filters in the basement at the pool uh, containing sand. Uh, I'm asking for $15,000 to change the existing sand in the filters. The last time the sand was changed was in August of 07. Uh, the general rule of thumb for sand and filters which is pretty boring topic is every 10 years or so if you do not do that the water clarity is greatly affected uh it begins to degrade all sand starting new begins to degrade since day one uh, i'm well over 10 years uh there's not too much else to say about it it's a it's something that's that needs to be done on these pool filters I believe in doing it every seven years. I've been putting it off. I, I I added COVID to it. There's not a lot of people in the pool. Now this fit the sand takes out every bad thing in the pool water, and over time it simply wears out. It's a natural occurrence of uh, number twenty silica sand in that filter. There's over ten thousand pounds between the two filters sucked out of the tanks trucked off as hazardous waste, new sand is put in, and approximately 10 years later, we may look at it again, and hopefully I won't be here, but I don't know. <laughs> Tony, maybe we can uh, earmark this as long overdue, it looks like, so maybe we can earmark this as a possible project if we have any money left over in uh, contingency. You could do that, yes. Yeah, well, I think it's I mean, it's uh, 10 years or whatever, and it's 14. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, it all depends. You have to keep an eye on it, and you right. can tell the water clarity is either being affected by the, the chemical, uh, bad chemicals, uh, improper water balancing, or bad sand. And I've done it before in filters prior to these Astral filters that are currently in there. It's just something that usually needs to be done. We'll keep our eye on it. Okay. The next item is 14,300 for a diving board, a ladder, I mean, a, a stand assembly and a fulcrum box. There are four components to the pool diving board. Uh, in 2021, I replaced the ladder assembly. That's how you get up onto the board. The board, the rear of the board is attached to the ladder assembly. That was severely, severely deteriorated. Uh, the board right now, the paint, is starting to come off the board. Uh, the leg assembly and the fulcrum block box underneath the center of the board is becoming very deteriorated. So I called a month and a half ago to get a, a price to replace three of the four components. It was fourteen hundred or fourteen thousand and three hundred. I called Monday. The price went up two thousand dollars. <laughs> I was also advised there'd be another price increase January 1st. So I can best estimate that to replace three of the four components of the diving board stand and board will be roughly $18,000. Well, the whole assembly is only 12 years old. I got the whole assembly 12 years ago for $12,000. It's my personal opinion after talking with the recreation director and because of COVID and we don't have enough children swimming in the pool to utilize the board 
that I am requesting to remove this item from the capital budget tonight and relook at it two years from now. I don't think it's fair to tell me on the phone that the increase is due to labor shortage and raw materials. So I think it's prudent that we wait two years and I'll look at it again. If I feel the board is unsafe at any time, it's inspected every week, I'll take the board out of service till such time we get new components. That that's, sounds good. That's, that's sounds on, good. Take it out. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, we're only sending half the kids to camp and we have no children swimming on weekends and nights. So there's, I, I prefer to take it out. Smart thing to do. You're on, you're on top of this thing, Brad. So we'll, we'll, we'll defer to you. All right. And last item I think I have is in 20, fiscal year 25 is for some stalls and frames for the men's locker room that you walk into before you use the, I should say, the, the toilet. But that's out in 2025. And I believe that's it for pool and gym. Yes, it is. Any questions for Brad? Uh, Matt, could I interrupt a moment? I just got a text from Paul Kyriakos and he's telling me he cannot unmute or share video. He's uh, thinking he's not perhaps a panelist. So I know poor Karen's at Jerry's desk. I don't know if she can. And uh, add him up as a panelist from there, or she has to go back to where Brad is. <laughs> I don't know. Beth, I think the way that he's in, it's not allowing me to promote him to a panelist. Okay. You want to resend him a link or something? I'm. Oh yeah, I yeah, see. Yeah, Paul. Okay. okay, I'm sorry to interrupt everybody. I can't do it from here. What if I, I couldn't do mine, right? Forward my link to him. Some one of the board members is an attendee and I can't promote him. Aaron, come on in here. <laughs> You'll all excuse me. You could have your, thank yeah. you for your use of your computer. Thank Thanks, you, Brad. He said he sees you. <laughs> I see her. Okay, I just sent one to him. Okay. Well, he's doing that. Why don't we get going? Why don't we continue on here? Can uh, Adam get on your? Yeah, yeah he can okay. come in right now. Okay, Adam Parks is yours. Hello, everybody. I'm Adam Parsons. I'm in charge of the Parks Department. Let's get this ball rolling on my capital and let's talk about the first item I'm asking for. It's um, a snow machine removal. It's a small tractor with a power broom and a snow blower attachment on it. On our campus that we remove snow by you know the sidewalks and whatnot, we have a snow blower and approximately three people that do this during a snowstorm. This machine, just let me give you an example of what it can do. Um, just
just a sidewalk in front of the library out on Newt Road and Meeting House. That one sidewalk would take almost 45 minutes or better for uh, to clear it. Say if you had six inches of snow on it. This, this machine literally can do it in five minutes. <laughs> and you're in a closed cab, uh, moving along at a nice speed. You know, five minutes versus 45 minutes. Um, and you do that all the way around town. The timing that you'd save is incredible. Plus, you're not lifting any snow with a shovel, shovel or whatnot. You're doing very minimal snow removal that way. So this, in my opinion, is a well-deserved you know, piece of equipment that we need. And we've talked about this before. It comes with a drop spreader so you can spread the, the salt right behind as you remove the snow. So I think it's an incredible machine. There's a few town, a uh, few towns close by that that uh, purchased it and they use it, and I've talked to them about it, and uh, they love them. So that's why I think about this machine, and it uh, should be purchased. I'm asking for in 23. Okay. Any questions on this? Next item is uh, Parks pickup. Um, this pickup, you know, pulls the mowers around from ball field to ball field. Um, it's a 2006. It has uh, 70,000 miles on it now. I think the replacement should be around um, 2025. It'll have approximately 100,000 miles on it. By then, it'll probably be a pretty much a rust bucket. Hmm. <laughs> um, so that's that. In a nutshell, it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Third item is uh which we've talked about in the past it's our ball field grooming machine uh, which was purchased in 1999 which is 21 years old uh, we had some issues with it we had the mechanics rebuild the motor and it's running right now uh, just because it's sold uh, you know the hydraulics are getting weak uh, machine is rusting it's just getting old and i think a replacement it would be in 2024 is going to be needed Hopefully not before then. And if I can, if I could stretch it out a little bit further, I'll try to do it. <clears throat> That's an important machine too. And it makes the ball fields look fantastic. Um, groom their ball fields Monday, Wednesday, and Friday before tournaments. We have seven baseball fields throughout the town, uh, which go all season. So this is a very, very uh, important machine. So Tony, I'm curious. Yep. You're, you're obviously uh, on top of this money that we got. Can, can any of these things be be uh, considered for that federal money we got? Do we have to uh, make a? There's got to be a relationship to, uh, and we're learning every day about this. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be a relationship to COVID. Use of outdoor spaces is one, um, but to, so far all we've heard on that regard is to improve. Uh, existing facilities uh, like playgrounds and other other facilities that may have been uh, used excessively during COVID. I'm not sure about equipment. That's a good question. We can certainly well, ask that. Obviously, as, as we go through this, you're going to learn more and more about it. So, Right. Yeah, we certainly do every day. Keep that stuff in mind, you know, why not? We're waiting for a, um, right now there's an interim rule, interim final rule. We're waiting for the final rule to come out to give us more clarity on how to use the funds. And uh, it was it's supposed to be released this fall, but so far we have not seen it from the Treasury Department. So, okay, very good. Any um, other questions for Adam? Pretty straightforward. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> All right, everybody, have a good night. So, thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Adam. Next, uh, next is the um, the fire department. Who's here? Sean's here. How are you guys? Sean's here. Where's Sean? Oh, oh there he is. <laughs> I have uh, Karen Kravitz with me also. Hey, okay, how you doing, Karen? Sure. Hi, everybody. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, on the first one is Engine Three. This is the would be the second payment for the 2020 truck we received last year. Um, so we would be requesting this payment. Uh, for 175 528 there are any questions on engine three that that vehicle is in full service it is yep 
pops their first attack engine out. The next, the next uh, item is air packs. As you remember, about four or five years ago, we replaced uh, quite a few air packs. Uh, they meet, they met their fifteen year uh, expectancy life per DOT standards, and we have ten more air packs that are due coming up this year that we have to replace. Uh, they have to come out of service. Um, they're about ten thousand dollars a piece, so that's where that number comes in. These are the air packs, the, the SCBA. These are the Scott tanks that the guys put on their air, uh, on their backs and put the masks on and uh, breathe in a fire. This is a requirement. Mm. Are these are things where the masks are fitted to the firemen's faces. Yeah, they are. So every every firefighter has a mask, and it has to be. And every year they get fit tested. Um, so if your face changes or you gain weight, lose weight. They need the properly sized mask to fit their face, but the masks um, are interchangeable between all the air packs, but everybody's issued the mask that fits their face. Okay. The next one um, is engine nine. Uh, Karen, can I share my screen with them? I can do that. Okay. You've got it now, Sean. Okay. Sure. Okay, can you guys see that? Yep. yep. All right, so the current truck we have now is a 1995 E1 uh, engine rescue. It's actually a uh, tanker, tandem accident tanker. It holds 2,000 gallons of water. Uh, it's got a 1,500 GPM pump on it. And it's the and it goes and it responds on the second uh, second alarm to all structure fires. It's the first due piece for all uh, motor vehicle accidents, uh, car fires, any MVA. Um, the the current truck is going to be twenty eight years old, and as you remember, when we replaced engine seven, we started having catastrophic problems at like twenty three years of age. So, usually in a town like ours, usually um, we can squeeze 25, 25 years out of these uh, engines. Uh, right now we're at 28. And we're looking tomorrow to move forward on a new engine. Uh, and this is basically what we're looking at. Uh, to be a rescue pumper and hold 1,000 gallons of water instead of 2,000 gallons of water. So we're to a single axle truck to a little bit of a smaller truck. We'd have a Class A B foam pro system on it, meaning... This truck has the ability to shoot foam just like the other truck does for car fires. Uh, it'd have a 2,250 gallon pump. The other truck only has a 1,500. So as we've been replacing these trucks, we've been upping the pump size to 2,250. Like I said, it responds to all motor vehicle accidents, the backup to engine seven. So if engine seven has a problem or is out for service, this truck steps in and, um, Backs up and it supplies the main uh, the main engine at all structure fires. Like I said, it's a single axle vehicle. It's got a lot of ladder complement on it, meaning a roof ladder, an extension ladder, um, attic ladder. It's got a light tower on it, which is we don't have that on the current one. That's to light up the scene. So in the middle of the night or in the morning, we can uh, have a lot of visibility and we can see what we're doing. It's got a 10k generator on it which the other truck has a 25k generator on it so it's a smaller generator but reason being why we went with a smaller generator is everything is led so we're not drawing as much power on this truck um carries rescue equipment ampkis cutters and spreaders the, that's basically the jaws of life it's got an air and cord reel on the truck for rescue tools it's got a deck gun on it which the other truck has Carry it will carry 600 feet of large diameter hose, LDH, basically to lay in from a hydrant. It's going to have 
uh, pre-connects. It's going to have a defibrillator unit on it and medical bags on it. And as you can see, the cost is 989.016. And what we understand is there's going to be another price increase coming up in the new year. So I know we're on the agenda tomorrow night to look to replace this truck and hopefully get it ordered um, at some point before the first of the year. It, we are in need of it. Just to put it in perspective, though, um, even if we were to order it today, we probably won't see delivery on for two years. So we order it today, we'll see it, and hopefully not next year, probably the end of 23. And the way we've been doing other lease purchases of this size, we don't pay for it until once we have it for a year. So literally, we're not paying for this truck until uh, 2025, I believe. That's when we have it in. Um, there any questions on that? Okay. Um, I had one question, Sean. Um, does this truck have, does the pump on this truck have low temperature capability? Will this thing not freeze up when it gets really, really cold? No. So going back to that question, we had that issue a few years ago, and that was when we were fighting a um, house fire in Inwood Road, and the temperature no. was minus 20 with the wind chill, and we had multiple pumps. It, the pump itself didn't freeze. But what happens is uh, when it gets that cold with the wind, um, the hoses freeze. We had a bunch of valves break, uh, and there's really no way to prevent that. It's not the actual pump because the pump is running. It's the actual water that sits in the, in the valve. And we actually cracked half-inch brass valves in half with uh, how cold it was that night. So that's a rare occurrence, obviously. It is. That's that's the first time that's happened in well, probably over 30 years. Remember, that was a cold spell. Oh. Um, and just so you guys can see, I, I know this question's come up. I'm going to share my screen again with you. Um, Can you guys see that? Yep. So that's the list of um, all the vehicles that we basically have in service that run for the fire department. Um, so as you can see, the one highlighted is Engine 9 1995 E1 pumper, uh, holds 2,000 gallons of water with a 1,500 GPM pump. And these are the other vehicles. The other vehicle I want you to look at is number three on that line. It's car 201. And we're actually going to be talking about that at the next slide, which that's the fire marshal vehicle. That's a 2008 Ford Expedition. Um, it's got 100 and almost 70,000 miles on it. And basically the whole truck is uh, rotting and falling apart. Um, we've had uh, some big numbers to repair that. And that's at its end of its useful life. So. I know we have some money in there uh, in the budget right now for 13,000. Uh, we were able to go on um, and I don't know if it's going to still be available um, is a Chevy Tahoe uh, with the PPP package. And the number is around $40,000 to purchase it. And I'd like to start moving on this uh, as soon as we can, uh, because as you all know, to get a, to get a vehicle uh, nowadays is extre extremely difficult. And this is something we need to move forward with. The reason we have 13,000, we're asking for the other 40 is because we have to outfit it with lights and sirens and radios and everything else. So that's where that number comes from. So total of that vehicle would be 53,000? Correct, with lights, radios, equipment on it, trays. Can you transfer the lights and other equipment from the previous truck? 
What do you have to find? No, out? because the all the lights and everything are from 2008. They're all once we start doing it, all the wires are dry rotted. The seals on the bar and the lights are dry rotted. Once you start touching them, basically they fall apart, and we have other wiring issues with them. We're holding we're holding the smaller vehicles usually for about. We try to get uh, 12, 13 years out of them. So it's not like we're replacing those every three or four years. We're, we're trying to extend it. But as you know, even the vehicle you drive, it's really hard to get 12 or 13 years out of it, especially with like the road salt and everything else they put down on the road today. Plus, these are emergency vehicles, so they need to be uh, pretty good, pretty good uh, mechanically. Any other questions on that? Next is the aerial truck. So after we look at number nine and hopefully move forward on it this month, uh, this would be the next truck uh, that we need to look to replace. And I'd like to get through number nine and then we could have more discussion on the aerial. Because I know it's been a topic in the past, but this is something we really need to get serious on and look at uh, to move forward. Yeah, thermal. the thermal imaging cameras. So we need to replace two of these cameras. These are cameras we these are cameras we use quite often, uh, almost literally at almost every call we go on, whether it be an activated fire alarm, smell of smoke, um, car accidents, uh, possible ejections, looking for people in the woods, search and rescue. These are vital to what we do. Literally, these these cameras come off the truck almost at every single call. Um, and the replacement cost for the two of them is 19,000. Um, that's something we really should uh, take a look at and do this year. Um, these are just, it's amazing. 20 years ago, uh, they started coming out with them and they were $25,000 a camera and now they've come down, but the way we use them and how we do it, it's not strictly just for firefighting. It's, it's basically for everything. I mean, we had an accident couple of weeks ago where we thought possible we had an ejection and we actually had to scour the woods in the middle of the night and um, actually the trees to see if we could find a person if they got did get ejected from the vehicle and this saves a lot of time because the camera take, picks up uh, body temperature heat signature so when you turn that on it's actually a vital piece and you can pick up uh, anything warm in the distance it usually works for about 500 feet so if you're within 500 feet, you could usually pick something up. I mean, it will go farther than that, but optimally it's within 500 feet. If they, we could use them, uh, activated alarms where people spell smoke. Usually it's uh, like a light ballast going off where we're able to pinpoint it uh, to read the temperature in the ballast. So these are, these are vital to what we do operationally. The last ones are portable radios. So a few years ago, they allocated $2 million and we actually upgraded our radio system in town um, to a new GTR system. So that was actually the brain of it and um, nuts and bolts of it. What we're looking for here is we need to start replacing the portable, the firefighter portable radios and the mobiles in the trucks. These are the subscriber units. If you were on the board a few years ago, you kind of got a lesson on what they are. Basically, this is a portable radio and what a firefighter has along with a speaker mic and they go into a fire. Every firefighter is issued one. Um, so when they key up, it comes up like if mine would come up S Roland. Uh, so if there is an issue, uh, I would know exactly or whoever's in charge would know exactly who is calling or if they did have an issue. Uh, but Every firefighter is issued a portable radio, and some of the portables are now uh, 11, 12 years old, and we're having issues with them where even a simple thing like a button here, which is pretty simple to uh, cheap to get, the only, way to, to, the only way to fix it is basically we have to send it out to, it's called uh, depot in the radio, and that's a minimum of $750, even if it's for a button. So we need, in. The radios we have, there's newer generations out there. So at some point we have to look at the cost benefit of starting to replace the units, which the average expectancy is about 12 to 15 years. 
So we're right, we're right about 12 years old where we need to think about replacing these radios. Uh, we have 50 of them that we would need to replace for the guys. So that's where that number comes into. Does this include replacement of the radios in the vehicles as well, Sean? Yeah, so each truck has a mobile radio. It's called a mobile. What I just showed you is a portable radio. Mobile radio is a fixed radio goes into the truck and it's assigned to that truck. So when you key up, so if I were to pick up the radio and key up engine two, it comes up engine two and the radios in the trucks also have mutual aid built into them um, and everything else. The difference between a mobile radio that's in a truck and a portable radio, there's more power in a uh, in a mobile. So especially if we go out of town, they will talk on the uh, mobile radio because it has more power in old and the uh, signal will go a lot farther than the portable radio. Are there any questions on the radio stuff? I know it's a lot to digest. It's just a lot of stuff's coming up uh, all together here. Um, so. Is there anything else, Sean? I believe that's it. Any other questions for Sean, ladies and gentlemen? No? Okay. Thanks a lot, Sean. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Is someone here for the Thomas Darling or? Yep, I'm here. Let me just get it out of here. Let's see. Thomas Darling. Hi, Alexa. Hello. <laughs> okay. And if, if, if I could share screen, that might, uh, I thought that might be helpful for you. Somebody can enable that. Okay, you're all set. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, thank you guys for having me. Um, I thought it might be helpful for a little bit of background here since our requests are also based on grants and hopefully getting the, the town grant money to um, pay for some of these things. So the Historical Society um, has 10 year renewing agreement to manage the Darling site, which of course the town owns. Um, in 2020, uh, because of the pandemic, the state got rid of, um, for a, something called a survey and engineering and planning grant, a matching portion. So we were able to apply for a grant last year um, uh, to save the town about uh, $17,000 to get engineering surveys of the three large outbuildings at the uh, property. And based on that, we now have a six year um, plan, which I know is new for you and we did not have the plan the year before. But the reason again for that is that we were able to take advantage of this grant opportunity to, um, to, to do that. So um, what we've done for the, the six years is based on urgency, put a plan together for having the work um, that was identified in those engineering surveys done. And I can, um, the first one up uh, well, is the cow barn and some of that work is listed as urgent and I can show you um, a picture of that. Um, if you can see here a failed uh, uh, joint uh, supporting the roof and also here, this is the big double doors of the cow barn and you see this failed um, the split here. So, um, you know, these buildings uh, have been, you know, they're in good shape for their age, but they're 200 years old and they need um, a significant um, amount of work. So uh, the way that um, we put the budget together is to do the work for the cow barn first um, next year. Uh, you, and what we are hoping to do to help the town is to write historic, sorry, to write um, historic restoration fund grants. 
these are matching grants, 50-50 matching grants to the state. We've actually already submitted one for the cow barn. It will be re um, reviewed in early 2022. Um, and we will write uh, subsequent grants for the other parts of the project. The way that we put our budget together though is for the full amount of the project uh, for a few reasons. One is um, even if you get a grant from the state, if we're successful in getting the grants from the state, they um, are reimbursable grants. So you have to spend the money first and then they will reimburse for half the cost. So the money is needed up front. And they are grants, they are competitive. So there is not a guarantee we will get them. However, it's um, a high likelihood, especially after we get this first one, if we do a good job with it and um, they're happy that likely we can get subsequent grants. They fund the engineering surveys with the hopes that people will then apply to them for these historic restoration fund grants. So it is what they encourage us and want us to do. Um, the other, so one is we need to, the money up front to pay for the projects. And then, you know, things could happen with the state budget going forward in future years. And of course, there's no guarantee they could stop funding these. Things can happen with grants. So that's the other reason we were requesting the full amount for each of the projects in each year. Um, also, it would help to cover overages, even if um, if the costs go up for these projects, that it would still be then um, budgeted with the town. And even if the project becomes more expensive, which you always find things in, in construction projects, we would still be getting the grant funny money, but the money would still be there um, and it wouldn't be a surprise, hopefully addition to be adding more to the budget, we hope. And obviously, based on what I, the picture I just showed you, any of these things that are put off, um, not only do we risk losing, um, you know, historical integrity and, uh, and therefore these buildings as education and uh, resources for the town, but it would then make the cost to to try to preserve them um, that much more expensive. So I can give you more details on the specific years, but the first year is the cow barn. Um, you can only have one historic restoration fund grant at a time from the state. So we try to spread out the projects to maximize getting those grants so we can save the town as much money as possible. Um, the second year is because we will likely still be working on, um, have not closed out the grant for the cow barn, is to do the roof on the caretaker cottage and then the connecting barn. So um, the last capital project I believe we had was to do the roof on the main house, but the wing, the caretaker wing on the back um, was not done. That roof is just as old as the main house was and really is needing to be done. It's it's um, from the 1970s. And then the and it is a wood shingle roof. So it is, it is definitely at the end of its lifespan. And then the connecting barn is a shingle roof, uh, sorry, a, uh, just an asphalt roof that again is was last done at the end of the last century. So it's at the end of its um, lifespan as well. Um, as are the roofs for the other main outbuildings, but hopefully they will be um, budgeted within uh, the projects themselves. So then the next projects up um, in 25 and 26 would be the cow barn, I'm sorry, the horse barn, which is on the same side of the street as the house and what's connected to it, and um, the ice house, which is across the street and kind of on, uh, west of the cow barn. We can write one HRF grant for both of those buildings. So the goal would be again to write the grant, um, but the the buildings, you know, to do the buildings um, sequentially, um, and that's how the budget is for the house barn in the in twenty five, uh, and the ice house in twenty six. We are actually this month going to do um, immediate. Uh, stabilization of the ice house that they recommended. Um, the engineers were concerned that the ice house may not survive the next major snowstorm or wind event. So the historical societies raised money about $15,000 to 
uh, do that stabilization, but the rest of the repair and preservation work then um, can come in a few years. And then the last part of the budget is the house is in good shape. We have worked on the envelope project the last five years with painting and the roof, and we got grants to do painting as well. Um, but that the house itself needs an engineering survey. Um, and those have gone back to being matching grants. So what's in the budget then is, um, is to have town funds match uh, writing a grant to do an engineering survey on the house and the caretaker wing. Um, and then in the subsequent year, based on that engineering survey to have whatever work is done to need it to preserve the house. And of course, we don't know what those engineering surveys um, will find. So that last thing in, in 2028 is, is an estimate um, based on a few things we know and also what we've seen with the other building. So um, any questions? Hi, Alexia, I have a quick question for you. First of all, thank you for laying this out for us. Um, as we talked about at the Board of Selectmen, as we went through that process for that those grants, um, it's really important, I think, for the town to really get the scope of what's involved. And I guess if my math is right, that's about 315,000 worth of work over the five uh, years or so. So I guess my question is, um, what is the role of the society? Uh, do you contribute to other projects than this, or would you envision some contribution to these projects as, as they go along? So um, I think it's likely both. Um, you know, for instance, this year, the, the society is going to be spending, has, has and will spend $50,000 um, on the buildings at the site, and it was not in the town budget, so there were not any town funds, even in the regular line item. So that's painting, that's repairs, that's the alarm system needed to be fixed. Things come up. So I certainly expect that the historical society is going to do those things that it normally does every year to do smaller repairs, but they all add up to a, <laughs> a decent amount of money as well. Um, of course, we will write the grants to try to get half of these funds for the town. So we will certainly do that. And then if there are additional grants we can write and additional fundraising we can do to try to help with the matches, um, we can do that. Um, and we're certainly willing to do that. But again, based on whatever else is coming up, we're concerned about, we don't wanna have a grant and then not have a match for it and have to make a decision between turning down the grant or doing some other repair that comes up that we don't know is gonna come up you know, on the house or some other building. So um, so we wanted to to put these requests in. And, and the hope is that maybe, again, the full amounts aren't needed, but I don't think we want to do the opposite and then not be able to complete a project because the funds aren't there. Great. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's helpful information. OK, are there any other questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. All righty. Next on the agenda is uh, the Board of Selectmen. Is that you, Tony? Yes, it is. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Let me pull up the information here. So the uh, first project is also a work in progress like the um and like the uh, ARP design funds for the uh, HVAC work that we discussed earlier. So we're, we're, we're learning about the infrastructure grant that the federal government is putting forward is that the um, the towns will be able to take advantage of most likely lot SIP funding is how the grant funds will be administered. The lot SIP is the a local transportation capital improvement program. And um, it's typically administered by DOT. And so uh, if the town is going to take advantage of some of this infrastructure funds, uh, typically the, the projects have to be 60% uh, designed, which means that if you wanna do say a sidewalk or uh, 
a flooding improvement or a bridge improvement or whatever the infrastructure plan is, uh, they need to be a 60% design. And that's so that the grant funds aren't um, uh, earmarked for certain projects that either get stalled or that and it'll never happen, or I mean, that's been a problem in the past. So I think in order to make have the funds move quicker, uh, typically that's the requirement. So in order for us to qualify, we will need some funding. And this is not by any means the correct amount of funding, but we wanted to start the discussion so that we can we can have this discussion in, in you know, the, the town has to come up with a plan, of course, to use the infrastructure funds. So um, some pl planning component, which um, we're, we'll hopefully be discussing soon is part of this is to how best use those funds and which what um capital improvements do we think would be most beneficial to the town so we, we, whatever that happens to be we are and, it, we, and again we haven't gotten complete clarity on this and and so depending on timing maybe it gets delayed a year maybe it's a little less for next year and more for the year after we're not sure on many of the details but we wanted to at least have this as part of a discussion because uh, it, it's, at some point we're going to need to come up with some design costs for some of the projects should we want to do them. Does that make sense? And so basically, this you, you put these numbers in, but they really it's it's, it's just sort of an addition of a number, right? It's it's just a sort of an, a guess as to uh, you know, without having projects. Yeah. And estimate on design costs. We're not 100% sure exactly what that'll be, but there will be some figure. So um, we will, we'll, of course, modify this as we move forward. But I just wanted everyone to know that, you know, that's what we're learning about the um, about that. And also the DOT connectivity grant, which uh, is another grant that we've applied for that uh, we would need uh, planning and design costs. A lot of times uh, bigger towns have um, design staff that can can do that or have bigger budgets to accomplish some of this and, and we don't. So um, that's always a struggle for us when we apply for these grants. So that's okay, the first um, project. There'll be more to come on this. There'll be a lot more coming on this then. Yeah, okay. so, correct. All right, next, 2 million one. Okay. The old oh, any any, um, any uh, good capital plan for a six year period should have in it uh, projects that are at least under consideration. And so, um, we can not have a capital plan and not have this in there, uh, like other projects in the plan that are, uh, earmarked for bond funding. Uh, this is simply a, uh, for a planning tool and to provide the town with, uh, an estimate of what our capital needs are over the six year period. Okay. It's, um, this does not fund it. This just helps to identify it as a project. If the town is going to move forward with this, the town would have to complete the uh, process that is with all bonded projects, which would be board approval and town approval. So that's this project. I know you, I know you've reviewed this in the past, so I, I'm not going to go into the project unless there's any questions about it. It's basically the same project that was reviewed over this past summer. Okay. Okay. Any questions or comments on that? All right, next. And uh, the, the next project, the last one here is um, for a, um, a beautification plan for the town center. This includes some signage. Welcome to Woodbridge signs. If you've seen the signs along uh, Meeting House Lane that uh, that um, uh, identifies this, the police department in the center building, we've seen that they're they're in pretty bad shape. And considering it's the center of the town, we thought that it would be um, a time for some improvements to the signage around town. So that's basically the this project. Okay. I'm sure you've all seen the signs that are that I'm talking referring to. Any questions for Tony on the board of selectmen? No. Okay. Next is the Country Club of Woodbridge. So the Woodbridge project we've had in the past is for environmental remediation of the property. Um, we do not have a timeline on the remediation of the property, but we do have an obligation for that at some point. So again, in order to um, come up with a uh, our capital plan, we should have some mention of this project in the uh, in the um, 
planned. This is just an estimate based on the number we've received several years ago from a consultant, which was about 800,000 at the time. We've just increased it for um, uh, uh, cost of the living improvements over that time period. That's basically what that is. And uh, there's a lot of sort of it depend. There's a lot of information that goes into this. So this is just an estimate. It would you know, we need a lot more information on. A lot of it has to do with use and what the property is used for, which will determine the level of cleanup. So um, this is just again to identify this project. But this this area has been identified already, right? Where where the cleanup? We have a phase three, yeah. right? Environmental report which identifies several areas of the property that have some level of um, cleanup that may be required. Um, and we've done the most uh, serious cleanup, which is a, called a significant environmental hazard that was already cleaned up by the, um, by the way, they used to mix the uh, chemicals down by the, uh, yeah, right. by the maintenance facility. Yep. So that was, that was done uh, several years ago. And, um, but there are still other areas that would need further review and um, includes the cell tower site, the halfway house, it has a listed in there, a pond, um, the maintenance facility, there's some more issues there, and the main clubhouse. Those are the areas that were initially that were identified in the phase three. Okay. And there's no timeline on that. that there is no timeline. They, they the state changed that that regulation shortly after we um we um had the, the transfer of this property. So if we if, if the town decides they want to leave it the way it is forever. We ever have to do it? We would have to at some point do it. Okay. There's just no timeline on it. Okay. Uh, uh, so, Tony, if if we sell this property, are we obligated to clean it up right away? So, if we sell the property, that would be um, my guess is that would be part of the discussion on the sale. We're not necessarily obligated. It would depend on the terms of the sale and whose responsibility it was. In other words, you know, you can sell it. It could be a responsibility of this the buyer or it could be a responsibility of the town. Well, my question was if does deep require it to be remediated if it is sold. I, I you know, I, I could get clarification on that for you and report back to you. I, I don't want to, I don't want to speak here, but I could certainly, um, we do have some information on that and I can get that for you and get back to you on that. Okay. Okay. I'll make a note of that. If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, when we were dealing with the last two be, two um, uh, companies that were thinking of uh, building uh, 55 and over condos, there that was part of the, was part clean, of the discussion. The cleanup was part correct. of the contract. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we'll, like you said, that'll be a discussion. <clears throat> okay. Any questions on Country Club? All right, Tony, the last um, item is information systems. Okay, the first is the um, uh, the lease payments for the police department uh, upgrade, which is currently been completed. It's at, it's at its final stages of completion and it went very well. And so the project um, is financed through 2026. And um, the second project is the town's uh, you know, we we just um, it's been our experience that over after a five or six year period, the um, you know the network needs to be um, reviewed to see if um, any upgrades are necessary, and so that's just an estimate for the town network, which would was done in two thousand and twenty. Okay, so I tried to match them so yeah. that we're not doing two at the same time. Is that it? That's it. Any questions of Tony or anything or anybody? Anybody? No? I have a quick question about the network in the center building, Tony. I don't know if you are um, if you know about this or not, but I know that when we were doing the Beecher renovation, we were pulling wire when we were up in ceiling tiles and doing renovation work. I don't know if that would be contemplated if we're doing a future project there, if there's any sense in trying to time it so that we're 
you know, in there. So whenever we do a network project, we always review the wiring and change the wiring. It's always part of a project. Right. So if, if we're going to do a future project on the HVAC, does it coincide? Not? Does it make any sense to try to get them to line up? I don't know if that was contemplated or not. It hasn't been. We can certainly um, review that with the our design professional when we get to that point. Great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I seem to remember a discussion where they, they um, people who were discussing this, this project uh, talked about leaving additional uh, space in the conduit for pulling extra wires. Anybody else remember that? The police project, you mean? It was for the, um, it was for the, um, I believe it was the center building. No, it was for the, maybe it was for town hall when they were doing the communications. That's why I asked the question because I'm vague where, where it was, but I do remember the, um, leaving, leaving extra space in the conduit for future wiring. No, no, no. It's, not, it's not ringing a bell. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. It probably makes sense though. Well, I mean, the anticipation is when you go to, um, you know, fiber optic, you need more wires. Yeah. Right. That's the future of communication. <clears throat> okay. Is there anything else? All right, well, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, that concludes our capital budget reviews and. Um, <laughs> Of course, next will be in uh, the new year, the regular budgets, which should be interesting, I'm sure. So with that, I'll wish everybody a good evening. Take care. Bye, Thank everybody. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. Take care. Yeah.